Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 308, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jordan Tyra. Jordan, how are we doing? Good, thanks. Looking forward to this one. This is a good one because this is probably the first of its kind. Anyone watching on video will see. We've got four fine young men on the on the video. But this we talk a lot about the MDT and how um, we have to work as a team. And we're going to get a real insight into that today because we've got four practitioners. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in a second, all at the same club and off the back of a very successful season last year as well. So really interesting episode to come. Bestie, do you want to kick us off? Give us a little bit of background on yourself, but also what you currently do, your your role at the club. Yeah, so my my actual name is Matthew, um, but no one knows me as Matt, so it's, <laughs> it's formally Bestie for everyone. Um, so I'm the first team sports therapist here, and I have undergrad in sports therapy and uh, master's in SNC, so predominantly do a lot of the re- uh, rehab-based work around here. Um, and then me and Steve just work really closely within for the medical stuff. So to try and get as many kind of assessment based criteria right. And then yeah, that's about that's about me really. What about what about a bit of background? Give us a bit of background on yourself. Where have you been before? Uh, yeah, so perhaps. So me, yeah, me and Jordan used to work at Bournemouth together um in the academy, and then I worked first team in the Bournemouth for five seasons, yeah, and three seasons in the academy. And then made my way over to Portsmouth last year, last October. So just less than a year I've been here for now. So yeah, worked worked nearly ten years in football. Um and yeah, that's about that's about it for me. Brilliant. George, you've been on before. Well, George, how are we doing? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? All good, thank you, mate. Give us a little bit. Obviously, you went into detail before on on your background, but just give us a little bit on the background, but also what your role is at the club. Yeah, so my name's George. I started there in Portsmouth last November, so almost a year now. Um, I am first in a physical performance coach, but I'm mainly responsible for the pitch-based stuff, uh, GPS, warm-ups, all that sort of, sort of thing. Um, prior to starting here, I was in Leeds for seven seasons, um, seven years there, and uh, moved over to the UK. That was in 2017. Class. Max, what about yourself? Not to say, really. Uh, I'm Max. I'm the lead S and C coach here. Uh, my main role and responsibility is just the gym based stuff. So I look after all the pre and post training, uh, gym strength, power training. Really, um, was in the academy here season four last last year. Stepped up into the birthing environment, um, and then before that, I was at uh, Plymouth for two seasons as there to sports science in the academy. And then before that, I was in the birthing department with. Matt and Steve uh, as a junior strength and conditioning coach for three seasons, I believe it was. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. Steve, how about yourself? Thanks for the intro, Sen. I was young. So <laughs> I went to uni in the 90s. I've uh, been in football for 25 years now. I uh, started off at Millwall, did seven years there, did 15 years at Bournemouth, so from League Two up to the Prem. I left there three years ago, did a bit of consulting with teams, worked for the Premier League. And I came here just over a year ago. So, uh, yeah, it's been about a block of it. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, like I said before, obviously, off the back of a promotion year last year, but we're, we're fully into the season now, so it'd be nice to get some reflections from last year. As a department, Is what was the process from having that successful year and what were any lessons that you sort of took from last year going into this year as well? I don't know who wants to kick us off with that. Probably best for you, Steve, presumably. Yeah, so when I came in here last year, so I'm the head of medical here, there was literally no one. So Maxi was working the academy, so he stepped up to the first team and we had people helping out until I came in. Then I got Bestie in, where I worked with him at Bournemouth. So he was an intern of mine nine years ago initially. Yeah, 15, yeah. And then we got George in from Leeds uh, last November. So it was a tough season last year. And where you look at, we always want to get your highest uh, train availability, match availability. We had a lot of injuries last year. And a lot of them were contact injuries from games. So to get promoted with the squad that we had was unbelievable. 
So going into this year, obviously we wanted to try and uh, increase our match availability, train availability, but we did get rid of probably about 12 lads, didn't we? There was a big clear out of summer players out of contract, not in favour. Uh, brought a few in, but it's the usual one, lastminute.com. We had quite a lot in the last couple of weeks at the, uh, the window. So this season so far, we're five games in. Uh, we knew we we're not going to have a successful season on the pitches last year. I think we lost five games the whole season. Um, it's just carrying on what we've been doing. Got quite a new squad. As last year was a new squad. This is a new squad. It's just trying to carry on our philosophies, try and improve. It's a new leagues, the higher leagues, more intense. Uh, there's different, you know, as you go up through the divisions, as I know from my time at Bournemouth. Um, so really, Maxie and George will tell you more on the pitch stuff that we'll do with the lads and what we do in the gym. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to kick on what we were trying to continue from last season, really, and what we introduced to the boys. Yeah, it's difficult. I think I think my side uh, is a massive benefit going into this year is obviously we've moved into the new training facility. Um, and that's had a really, really big plus for us, uh, just because we've been able to uh, do a lot more the lads. It, it's, it's, that's frank with it. We've got um, we've managed to get Val in and the North Board, the four frames, four steps we didn't have last year. So we've managed to put in things that we planned last year to do in this season, which is really nice. We do uh, a lot more testing pre training with the guys now, which is fantastic. We get a lot more exposure with the lads uh, for their rehabilitation and testing um, within that side of things. And it's, it's a massive benefit for, for us because last year we only had uh, the Neuro Excellence Northern Board version and we had the Oxygen. Uh, we had a handheld dyno as well, but those are the only three things we had. And this year, where we've uh, promotions happened, we've been able to you know have a little bit more budget and kind of just better our practices last year. We were doing some testing, but it probably wasn't as good as we'd like it to be just because we didn't have the... Uh, the facilities one or just the equipment uh, now convinced this year we've got a lot better equipment um, I think our processes are really good this year in terms of our modern redness testing we've, I think we've nailed that down pretty well so far this year there's still things to improve in it I think um, we're working on some power BI stuff which is really good uh, a couple of interns we've got came in one came in last year he's transferred again this year brilliant for us has done that Jamie and uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing it's like the training facilities really helped massively, I think, because we had some practices last year and some bits we did well. But now this year we've managed to kind of really put it in place a lot more because we've got a lot more exposure to a better facility. Yeah, hey, definitely. A, I think. I, sorry, go ahead. sorry, George. I was just going to say, do you think that's been like a natural um, progression from you've mentioned about Steve said before about bringing everyone into the club, so now you've had time to sort of settle into roles plus adding then the promotion in, which comes with the financial benefit to that and getting the equipment. So do you feel like those progression, you just said about like the systems and the processes that you've put in place, if you feel like they're a lot more, like they, they work better now? Has that come just as a natural sort of progression from you guys being together a little bit longer, the team sort of taking shape? Yeah, I, I think so. I think the main issue last year is where me and George coming in October, November, and where Steve comes in the August, it was a very much stop start. People coming in different parts of the season, so you can't add things into the season straight away. When the especially when the team's winning, so I think the the nice thing this year is we're able to go into the off season as a solid four slash interns as well as as well as Rupak, um, and then we're able to kind of align what we want to do and then really implement it in the preseason. And I think I think we had a really good preseason this year, um, able to really put our stamp on it and. We work really well as a unit and I think the the nice thing with us all gelling, the best thing is that we can have them awkward conversations because they're not awkward, that you can have them big discussions because we work really closely with each other, that you can kind of, you don't, you're not sweating the small stuff, you can just say it as it is and if it's wrong, it's wrong or if it's like, oh, if someone else is thinking of something differently, we end up going to a way that we all agree on rather than just going, right, one person says, right, we're doing this. We end up we end up having them discussions all the time. What again isn't forced, it's just a, an environment that we've got and a culture that we've got. So I think the nicest thing with the progression through the league and and promotion is that we've able to implement what stuff we wanted to do last year that we weren't able to do just because of, of how relentless the league was last year, how there was no gaps in the schedule and in in a way the way that football works is just 
you implement stuff at the start of the season, you can't really add anything into the season. So um, that's why I thought when the best last year and, and into this season yeah. as well. I think, I think one of the things that helped us a lot last year was, well, was him to start was where it was only myself for the first month or two pre-season. We had a, a two physios that came in and they were only a part-time contract up until when Steve came in. Um, and then obviously you to come in. There was loads of stuff that I can't put in it, but and then we slowly implemented it a little bit when you two joined and Steve joined. And then by the end of the season, we knew exactly what we wanted to do yeah. going into next season. Um, and now I think we we'll pretty much do the majority of it, I'd say. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think we do. Yeah, I think to be honest, I'm pretty lucky to still be here. Um, my first game was against Blackpool. Yeah. And then I uh, got in like that. a 25 game on beat run, I think it was. And then we got absolutely back. <laughs> we been on five passes. Yeah. So yeah, it took a while to get over that one. And um, thankfully, we still got promoted. I would have been held responsible, I think. But then um, coming in in a position like that is incredibly hard because you're like, I can't change anything here. I literally cannot. Like, I need to know what they've been doing the last three, four months. I can't really chew away from that too much because um, this is what the players are used to. Um, as the kind of weeks went on, I seen a couple of little things that I would have liked to change slightly, but you had to give it that time. You, you couldn't jump in straight away and go change and everything. So a point came kind of naturally where we had run of kind of results that we weren't particularly happy with. And that was a, a really good opportunity then to step in and make the little changes that you wanted there and then. Um, I think as well in my interview, I, I mentioned to Steve that it was a brilliant time to come into the club because there'd been so much change. It meant that when you did start the role, you could have your own stamp on things and have your own, own kind of like as a as a, a department, we could all come together and put our stamp on things. Whereas if you're coming into one that's already formed, it's quite difficult then to hit, have that impact. Is that as much as it's probably a nice challenge when the team's winning, it's definitely better than the the alternative isn't it it's also really interesting to hear you speak about that because it's kind of if it's not broke don't fix it sort of mentality isn't it if the lads are doing what they need to do on the pitch but you guys know that there's x y and z that you could be implementing I, i'm guessing that is quite a tough decision knowing when to make that step and make that move but george has obviously mentioned it there that when you get that slight dip that's a potentially the time to act yeah and i think that's why pre-season was so important for us because it was the first time as a group that we were together to then make that worthwhile jump into different processes. So I think that's where off season was really quite, we, we organized it really well. Um, off season plans and stuff were really good. And then that just bled into the preseason. So I think that was been the, the nicest part of this transition so far. Um, and it just, it's nice because we've just had a stepping stone and hopefully we just keep on, keep on climbing in a way. Awesome. Um, I wanted to ask as well, from all your experiences, because obviously you've worked sort of Premier League level as well, you've seen what happens at that league, not not Championship where you are now. What were some of the thoughts going into this year? Because I'm sure there's, maybe not with staff as much, but definitely with fans and people are getting carried away, talking of the next step as well, getting, to the, getting back to the Premier League. So with all your experiences, was there anything where you're like, Okay, we've taken the program from here to here, but we know it's got to get to here to to get to that sort of level. Was that has that been a discussion at all in terms of the next steps? What you put in place? Yeah, like we've gone up and that budgets will increase, but what you see relaxed bits, which that's unbelievable to go bounce, bounce, you know, straight up. But for us, it's to up our game, stay in the league. We want to improve things. We know we can't change everything straight away so sort of future proof and so when I chatted to the powers that be to get stuff in you sort of plan and then plan for the next step as such but I appreciate budget I can't bring everything in at one time but like we've alluded to before we want to bring stuff in and make changes but you don't want to change loads of stuff you know you're not trying to reinvent the wheel so in my time, I've gone through doing your testing and then you do loads and loads of tests. And then you're like, when do you ever look at it? When do you have the time? What, what have I collected that data for? What good is it to me? So we just try and simplify it. So like we Max said earlier, when we do the redness, it's quick, it's easy, done. You can repeat it every day if you wanted to. But we'll tend to do it on like match day plus two. And if we need to retest, we will. So 
yeah, there's a lot of things I want to bring in, but you have to know when to ask and when not to ask, and when's a good time. And uh, I'm sure if I went with my full list, they would uh, look at me like I was a, yeah, don't swear on this, but yeah, it's just swear. timing. Yeah, and th th there's more things that I want, but I think what we brought in now is a very good starting block. And of course, you always want to have more, but sometimes it's not about having all the gadgets. It's, you know, how you use it, how you implement things, how you educate players. That, that, that for me is a major one as well. There's no point having this fancy machine if you don't educate players and tell them why you're doing this, why they need to do this, what's best for them. Jordan, this is a discussion we've had a lot, isn't it, recently? And the, the podcast that's gone out today with Martin Bouchet, it was the Sports Science 3.0. And this is basically the layer that he's adding onto it now in terms of we've got our testing, we know what we can test, but every situation at a club, the, the context is so different club to club and the staff and all the rest of it. So that's that's it's interesting that comes up, Jordan, isn't it? That That's um, something that we've discussed a lot recently. Yeah, it was, it was actually the perfect sort of segue for isn't it? Um, but I think the, the point the guys have made there is is spot on in, in that, you know, if you come in, you had last season, you talk about ops jumps and things like that, um, some clubs might say, oh, we'd love that. But I think if you compare to most first team environments um, and actually most academy environments nowadays, certainly if you're looking at Cat 1 and Cat 2 clubs, you know, they've, they've probably got more gadgets and gizmos than, than you know, first team environments in League 1 stuff sometimes. Um, and yet you can still produce outstanding results. And I think that's the important thing. Um, and that's obviously what Martin was talking about on the podcast, that we need to remember the basics, exactly like you were saying, Esteem, in terms of, you know, this is all well and good collecting loads of data, but if you're not using it and implementing it well, you're not going to get good results with the players. And I love the point of educating um, the players as well. The question I've got for you, for you guys is, you're a smaller team than probably some teams you've come up against. Certainly in the in championship now, there's obviously a big, big range of teams now in terms of performance departments. Do you think a, a slightly smaller team allows a, a slightly high level of cohesion? Because, you know, the, the experience in that room is, is awesome in terms of years and clubs and everything like that and leagues and everything. So you've all experienced different, you know, different big big departments, small departments, medium sized. You know, like Bestie was alluding to, you all get on, you all know each other, you can have that conversation, make it, actually, I see it this way, you see it that way. Do you, do you think that being a slightly smaller, close knit team is allowing for better results? Yeah, um, communication is key. Sometimes I find when you've got too many people, you always assume that someone said something. So when I first went to Bournemouth, I was on my own. So I could only talk to myself, really. <laughs> and you were putting out fires. Like, you, like Max said when he first came in, there were things you wanted to put in that you couldn't. But communication is great, because I only have myself and the manager to talk to. I was talking on another podcast a few months ago, and they asked me about my time at Bournemouth, any regrets. And I, it's Bournemouth, we're not talking to Man City or Liverpool. It's a Premier League team, but not the big one. And one of my main regrets was I employed too many staff, which some people look at and think, but I think it was. There was too many in the end. And it just lost that. You were sometimes relied on others, didn't do it yourself, et cetera. So yes, I'd love to have another member of staff in here, but us four plus Rupert, we've got another lad that's part-time, the five of us. We do the jobs to the best of our ability. And I'm you know, not blowing smoke out in the arse, but I think we're doing a good job. Um, but sometimes I think when you have too many, you can just lose those lines of communication with the manager, with the coaches, with the analyst department. Luckily with ourselves, we've got an office together, which last season we didn't. And I think that's a huge thing to do, actually sat together in the morning before training and after, because we can discuss things. How was so-and-so? How was he today? Oh, I've done this with this player today, like we said this morning. I didn't actually do that. Let's try and fit it in tomorrow. And it's very good where sometimes that got missed out. So, yeah, I do feel you don't want to have a one-man band. I don't think I'd ever go back to that again. No way. Not in my age. But it's, uh, I sometimes think a big team can be an issue sometimes. It can be. Um, we all use interns. We've got an intern, but I know before I've had interns and you put too much on them, you expect too much from them. It's too well. They come in for a reason to, to learn. 
So you have to give that bit back. You just can't expect them to, oh, you set that up, or you do that, you do this. I'm in charge of this team, but I'm not dictator. They've all got their skills. So go and show them and spread your wings, show me what you can do. You know, I, I don't like yes men. Come in, if I say something, tell me if I'm wrong or tell me if you've got a better view to come forward. And I just think that's the only way you can grow. Um, if you're just a yes man, and you, oh, I should have said that, say it. Don't, don't say after the event, oh, we should have done that. And it's the same one if you have a plan for a player and you agree that plan before you talk to them, don't tell them, oh, we should have done this. No, that's our plan, we'll go with it, et cetera. I don't know what you guys think, you know, I've worked at, you've worked at Leeds, size of the club, and you was at Plymouth and that, what you thought, like numbers of staff, et cetera. I think, like, at Leeds probably a lot. Like, when I was at Plymouth, I was, so we had a, uh, I was there as head of academy sports science, it was just me and one physio, and the first team just had a head of fitness conditioning, and to uh, a physio and a sports therapist, so it was it was five of uh, a first team and an uh, eighteen. Um, so it was actually bigger here than it was at Plymouth. Um, I think from that side of view, from an academy point of view, when I was there, it was really easy with lines of communication because like there was only one person I'd go to if I needed a bit of advice on anything or talk to about anything in terms of in the club or anything like that. Um, and then the flip side of it, when I was born with you guys. Um, back in our friend days, it was just there was I think six of us at one point in in our office, and that was just sports science, let alone the office downstairs for the uh, the medical team. Um, it's difficult. I think like you need to find a really fine balance because I think we've actually got quite a nice balance here. I think maybe one or two more would be nice, but that's yeah. that's plucking on strings. I think you don't probably need yet um, because the other part is as a whole MPT, not just us as performance and medical as the analysts and coaches as well. We're, we're a really small group. Like, our morning meetings every morning is in one room. Yeah. Everyone yeah, sat around table. one table, yeah. uh, which is a bit of a joke. Really. It's, it's a great table, table though. It's a fantastic it's a table. table. Yeah. Like, really, like, good end table. Yeah. I think that's a, that, that's probably the most crucial thing for a good end team. Yeah, it's a good the, table. The quality of table. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, every morning we have our little morning medical meeting, and then after that we go in with the coaches and the analysts, and everyone's in that one meeting, sport yeah. director, club set, and that's it's a really nice clear line of communications on those days and that's the same thing with steve said there like everything's brought up in those meetings i'd say i think we, we probably don't not get a lot not done if that makes sense yeah no exactly yeah it's an open room as well everyone has a voice yeah. and they you're free to say say whatever your opinion is and it's, it's definitely listened to um so they're really good for that the coaches and friends yeah. have got a really good um relationship with those guys so that that helps massively yeah, I think I think the most important thing is the environment. So like I've worked with Steve for a long time and I've worked with Max for quite a long time and me and George are relatively new, but the, the environment, the culture that's already here and building is probably the most is the key thing to the um kind of how well everything's working. Um I think you could have a, an abundance of staff if the environment, the culture's toxic or poor, the communication's poor, the work rate's poor, the ethics poor. And it just doesn't work. Whereas I think we've got a really good environment. Everyone's actually able to go and, like Steve said, spread their wings, try try something new, get it backed. And and even if them difficult conversations come up, it's more of a discussion rather than a, oh, you've messed up today. Um, it's more like, oh, let's learn from it. Let's let's go and um, unpick this and, and make sure we don't make that same mistake. So in a way, it's like pushing towards trying to make mistakes in a way, but like learning from them um as well because at the end of the day we're in an industry where things are aren't completely tried and tested and you want to try and push the boundaries as well so i think having the small group is really it's really powerful and as well you've got a lot of workload on that you're learning all the time as well so as a as a, like a selfish point of view you see a lot you do a lot and you you learn a lot as well so it's really interesting around that, that sort of staff numbers, isn't it? Again, it's a topic that's come up before. And when you look at some of these departments that have got a lot of coaches, you just think in terms of, not in terms of the roles, but just in terms of like personalities, there's got to be some clashes that are going on when you've got so many people in a room together. But one thing I was going to ask, and it's really interesting you bring the table up, because I was going to, I was going to ask about, what are some of the factors, and these might be really simple things that you feel like a lot of other clubs are just doing day to day anyway, but you've mentioned sort of the, the meeting, sitting around and having the conversation. You've said about sitting around the table and it being an open room. 
Is there anything else that you think contributes to a, co a cohesive team, like open conversations? Like what, what else has gone into this sort of culture and this environment that you feel is important? Yeah, yeah, we um spawn director and the and the gaffer have uh like staff yeah. finds like staff court. So every Friday we sit around the table to do a court session. <laughs> so any any anything yeah. that is deemed wrong is yeah. is comes up in court and it's deemed a fine of whatever the <laughs> whatever the judge says so typically one pound and i was yeah. fine pound for the last time for being on your podcast so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it for this today, I yeah yeah it's, so, it's stupid i think that's it's nice because a, a, a serious side of it is like you bring up things that you sometimes a bit of an awkward conversation like a few times where i'm going to out here but but bestie won't switch gps on when yeah, he goes out he'll read. Read. <laughs> so we're fine for that and it like it to be fair like it's it's an awful yeah. conversation to start off with because it's like obviously we lose data and especially with rehab like, yeah, yeah. crucially but it gets to the point where it's like what well, like it's not yeah and it, it's it's one that it sets a standard so you go right actually i have messed up it's in it's it's done in a good in a good way but you go actually i've, I've made a mistake so you learn from it and you go pay your pound or your two pound whatever it is and you go, right, I ain't doing that again. Unfortunately, I've done it twice. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but I think another one, that we work hard, we're serious about jobs, but we have fun outside of it. So we'll go out, but not just as a medical team, we'll go out with the coaches, we'll go out with the analysts, we'll go out with recruitment. So we're, we're as a group, that even they know the wives, so you have where the partners and your wives and out of there. So it's really good on that front, I think. You know, I've been at clubs where... You may never meet anyone else's partner or know their name or anything like that. We're here, you know, in my first season, it was quite a few times we went out as a group, whether it was just staff or with partners. Collect. And I think that's a huge one sometimes, just having that togetherness. And so when we're at game day, you, you know that your missus is up in the in the stand with someone else is in the chat and they're not on the road waiting for you or when you're coming out and going home and stuff like that. It's a, it's a massive difference. So there, I think we've really got on well, um, which is sometimes easy when you've got a small group, but you can do that when you've got a big group. And uh, I think we had a couple of days ago, wasn't it? we had like a questionnaire around WhatsApp, you know, staff do, where do you want to go? So we're giving options and all that. So I think I picked every single one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they're really important though aren't they like oh, yeah. for any team all the things you've mentioned there are, are, are so important and when you see like a cohesive team I think they've got an element of some of that going on whether it's like like you say about the court some sort of thing thing in place where you can call people out in a in an environment that's not sort of threatening and aggressive like it but it keeps you on point doesn't it it's keeping yeah. the status high so I think that's really important. And the, the, obviously the family stuff and the, the partners and all the rest of it, and, and the going out, like I feel like some clubs have kind of lost that side of it, hasn't they? Like the social side where it becomes far too much on the day-to-day. -day. You go to work, you leave, you don't speak to that person until the next day. Whereas that, there's that, you can see it when you guys are speaking. There's obviously a good relationship between you that you can open up good conversations. And that's only going to lead to good things. Yeah, and when you work in football, you're probably at work more than you're at home, to be yeah. quite honest with you. So to involve your family into that, um, I, I think it's huge, you know, because whenever I go home, whether you're having a good season, not season, I if I go through that door, I don't want to talk about football. That's mm. it, which is hard because my son's 18, and that's all he wants to talk about. <laughs> but you try and swerve it, but... Yeah, I just that's it. Don't talk about it. done. But to involve them in our side, and like last year was a real good season, and to have them, they probably didn't enjoy it as much as we did that night. But for them to enjoy it was brilliant because it, it it was them as well. You know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my wife and all that. You know what we've been through. The same with these. You you can't do it without them. Obviously, we can do our day to day stuff here, but we can't do it all that. Us. It sounds a bit cheesy, but it's true. You can't do it without them. You know, I've got three kids. I couldn't have done all this in football if my wife wasn't there looking after those three. You know, so for me, that's massive. And it's been missed in other clubs that I've been at. That bit of it has been, we still get on and do our work. 
but that side of it's not been very good. Like the, the away from the club, if you know what I mean, it's just turn up, do your job, go home, and done. No one knew anything about it, didn't know anything about what was going on, etc. Uh, here, I just think you can, um, we're having a laugh and joke, but if something that was up, you can always pull someone, confide in them and stuff like that, it wouldn't go any further, etc. And uh, it's a good team to work for. So I think in all my years, I'll probably say this, I'm enjoying it. This is the most I've enjoyed it in a long, long time. Steve, just off the back of that, you mentioned about getting the guys in at, at different points. How much of that was your trust in them as a person and a practitioner? And how much of it was that you saw the sort of environment at the club and you were like, we need a person to fill this position at this time with this group of players and this person fits? Yeah, so I was approached by Portsmouth last summer, so it was in the off-season. And I've been out of football full-time for two years then. I've done a bit consulting. I was doing work with the Premier League on like tournaments. I was working in clinics, and I'm quite happy having my weekends and that. And uh, <laughs> when, 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 I got, yeah, when I got approached, I spoke to Portsmouth and I went back and spoke to my missus and I was expecting her, why are we talking? And she was like, well, why don't you follow it up? So I was a bit like, okay. So I mentioned my son, there's no point in asking him because I knew what his answer would be back in football. So I asked my daughters and they were like, well, you've been a pain in the ass for the last two years. <laughs> All right, brilliant. So I spoke to him. And when I spoke to the club, I just asked about staffing, like we're in League One, you've cleared everyone out, what have I got? You know, what, you know, so I said what staff I'd want to bring in, you know, numbers. And Bestie was part of that stuff. So I come in, I've got someone I want to bring in with me. Someone I've worked with, someone I've brought up with me from graduation all the way through, who would be really good around the lads. So Bestie was sort of it came in after, but that was work in process. I knew that Max was here and he'd worked uh, with me at Bournemouth and then went to Plymouth and come back. And I just said, put him up into the first team. Just put him up. He'll surprise you. They shouldn't have been surprised. Mm -hmm. And he stepped up. And then when I came in, and obviously I had Bestie and uh, Max from Bournemouth, I didn't want it to be AFC Portsmouth, so I didn't want another Bournemouth, so I, I could have maybe asked someone else, but that's when we opened it up and we advertised and um, spoke to a few people. Unfortunately, we ended up with George. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, but George came in and we, we had a couple of chats with him uh, and it just worked. It was very interesting hearing his side from his time at Leeds, going up through the academy to the, the 23s. But, yeah, sometimes it's just not looking at CVs. It's are they fit for the team? So when we did the interviews, it was me and the sporting director. And obviously I'd look on the medical side, the sports science side, but he was, would it be a fit with the, with the team? So on George's second interview, he actually came in on the training day, watched us train. Just when we was in the canteen at lunchtime, he sat with Max, he sat with the manager, sat with the coaches, and that, you know, just had an informal chat with him. Really. It wasn't really an interview. And sometimes that's when you get to know people more rather than like firing questions at them. And um, yeah, somehow they liked it. So, um, you know, I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> no, but, it's, but that's how it works. Uh, you know, I've worked with some people before that have been really, really good at what they do, but their people skills aren't very good. And it just didn't work. Whereas here, everyone gets along. Like we say, open floor, say what you've got to say. And uh, that, that, that was basically what we based it on. So obviously these two I knew, George really brought in, but it just has to be a fit for the team and everyone, um, really. So that's what we based it on. And yeah, I alluded to too many staff. I'd like to add more staff, um, but you know, a little bit at a time. What you meant to say is you listened to the podcast that we did with George and that that's, was, yeah, that's yeah. what tipped you. Yeah. yeah. 
I would I do listen to the podcast. I can listen to it. <laughs> we probably sound like broken records at the recording because I feel like we talk about of a lot of similar topics, but when we've got a, a number of members of staff on the podcast in one go, I think it'll be only right to talk about one of the things that we've spoken about a lot recently. So you brought it up when we spoke about topics for the podcast around fixtures. So do you want to do you want to put that to the lads? Yeah. So obviously, Rodri came out in the press, didn't he? In the news article that came out talking about um, players are close to the point of having to go on strike over fixture congestion and this, that, the other in the top league and Champions League and. You know, every other competition that seems to be created now, and we've got an international break after three games in the Premier League and stuff like this. So, slightly different in League One, slightly different in Championship, but the fixture congestion is, you know, let's face it, the Championship is one of the most competitive leagues in Europe, um, certainly in terms of how quick, thick, and fast those games come. From a, a performance department, um, looking at a medical department, looking at players, and, and you know them better than anyone else. Do you agree with the players on this one, or are you thinking now they can they can handle a bit more? It's hard, yeah. Yeah. but I think in the position that we're in, yeah, and um, if we just speak for ourselves, I think at the moment we're we're doing fine. It's it's a lot easier than it was last season. Yeah. I know when Christmas comes around, we won't be saying the same. Yeah. Yeah. But at this moment in time, it's it's easier than it was for me last season. Yeah. Um. I do understand where, where they're coming from in the Champions League and then internationals and everything else. But I think the biggest challenge for us at the moment is trying to sort travel for, like we've Burnley away on Saturday, so we're seven hours on a bus. Other teams will fly. But we're trying to plan how we're going to get to Burnley by coach. Uh, that's our only option um, for us. So we need to be able to have the lads up to Burnley and in good shape, ready to play on Saturday. Um, so that's where our biggest challenge comes in at the minute. But yeah, yeah, and we and we've got a, f a couple of internationals like especially over like in Australia we've got a couple, of, and it's just trying to work out logistics in terms of when they're back, um, and being clever when they return to training. And again, it's just where we discuss it. And we every every player is individual, and we just try to make sure make a good decision for them, um, to eliminate risk and everything. So, um, like it's it, it's difficult to discuss like players like Rodri and that and. And their fixtures, but when we look at ours and our issues and stuff, I think the the main thing is as long as we're clear and concise on what we think is deemed correct or what we feel is the best best route to take, I think that's we're on the same page with it most of the time. So, um, but there's always hardship in every league. The championship yeah. is is hard. It's physical. It's a step up from League One for sure. Um, and the fixtures are coming thick and fast, but. The the one thing with the champ where you've got the international breaks kind of has these windows of opportunities. We we kind of look at them at. So yeah, it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult topic. I do I understand where he's coming from completely, but it's in a way we focus on what on what, what's in front of us yeah. rather than yeah you knowing the unknown. With your top elite players, yeah, when you've got an international break, they represent their country. So I get that, and then when you get to have a summer break. You're in a championship, so yeah, it can be like when do you ever get a break? You don't get the full summer uh, time off. It's probably easier in the champion. It wasn't League One, League Two because you haven't got the Crystal Street Moats Trophy, so that's one trophy down. So you still got your Carabao and your FA Cup. Um, I'll probably say Christmas is always one because it's tradition. We play those games because it's tradition. It's people have the time off. Well, sometimes you've got a game on Boxing Day on the 28th. But sometimes I think the Christmas period is a bit ridiculous. Um, so that that one for me may be one that could just calm down a little bit because you think with all the leagues, you're still going to get enough football on telly. Like you, you have all that. And now I, I love football, but you go home and you've got it on at two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock. Like, you know, it's like, just have one game that day, one the next. I'm sure you could spread it all out. You've got every club on TV during Christmas, but they all have like a good rest. And yes, it's our job. We choose to work in football as staff and as players, but I'm sure they want to see a side of it as well. You know, 
I'm not saying they're going to get plastered one night and play the next, but they want to spend time with their families and stuff like that. So the game is the game. You know how many games you've got in the season. If you have a cup run, you have more. But I do think in my time, football Christmas could be a little bit better for the schedule. Something we were only discussing the other day, you know, the challenges we're kind of faced with the whole international breaks, as well as the fact that when players go away with all the different associations, yeah. some are really good, like really detailed reports coming back, and then some of those are just not what you'd expect. So we're debating whether we send our own GPS unit with the players, and we're both because you're trying to fix up data and trying like it's just not the same as how we collect ours. So it's only one part of it, I guess, but that, that is a bit of a challenge for us at the minute. Yeah. You can imagine these top clubs where they've got stone black, almost all squads going out to different places, getting that data back sometimes for being out of the especially if some of them go to countries that aren't as well as quick as in England or anything like that, um, yeah. in terms of just collecting data, day in, day out, really. Um, it, I can imagine at that end, especially as an attack breaks, it could be yeah. that for a performance team to try to gather data together, especially where, say, someone has to only get back the Tuesday of that week and they've got a Saturday game um, trying to get data together to ready to present to the manager to say, well, he's travelled so much, this is data. Um, I can imagine some clubs, your, your top end clubs that have quite a lot of international players um, find it really difficult to to manage that. Um, but I guess you can only control the controllable sometimes, I think. Yeah. Um, from our point of view, like when we do get the data back, I think we manage it well enough, I'd like to think. Uh, I think sometimes the data doesn't come back as well as we'd like, but we still have a bit more common sense just to kind of err on the side of caution sometimes. Um, and then it's difficult within the tax Like one, one, one thing in the tax breaks for me is like League One is a difficult one because they're not guaranteed, like, and they happen sometimes a week in advance. Like sometimes we don't actually know if we're getting an international break until yeah. the week before. So we can't plan very well going into it. I think that's one thing that might be able to do better in league in, in league one especially because there's some weeks where up until maybe the weekend just going into the weekend yeah, after yeah, the cool. break and you, yeah. you suddenly get another call up and then yeah. you've got an international break and you've got to try plan that week. Yeah. I think one one thing about last year's international break maybe was like the Barnston game was an international break and then yeah, that got so. postponed and we actually ended up winning the league on that on that Tuesday night, which was an amazing atmosphere to have it on as well. Mm, yeah. That's obviously from the, the coach's perspective, and I appreciate everything you've spoken about there because, that, like you say, you can control the controllables. Some of it is literally out of your control in terms of fixtures you deal with what's in front of you. Like the trip to Burnley, the, coming to the Northwest is not a bad thing, I've got to tell you. <laughs> uh, but just on that, what about player perspective? Because obviously that's Rodri's perspective. Do you hear anything around the players, it, it, like your players in terms of, their perception on how fixtures are, or are they similar in terms of this is what's in front of us, we get on with it? Really good question. Yeah. Uh, I think, like, there's two, so, there's, yeah, there's two sides to it, I think. For me, like, <laughs> unfortunately, football, we get players at the moment, and yeah. we do have a few of them, no matter what it is. Nah. Like, it could be, we could have too many games or too little games, and no yeah. matter what happens, they, they're going to learn about it, I think. Um, <laughs> Like that's just that it's just even worse for you kind of know footballers. Um, but I think that I, I, I do think it's just complete hands the group. Like yeah. we're really fortunate here to have a, a really, really good group of lads yeah. that know the league and know how football works and they, they get on with it so well to be yeah. better. Like I can't see there there are obviously moments of bone and they say like they wish things would be done better sometimes, but I think like and as we say to them, we just we just can try and control the troubles from our side of things. I think that puts them at ease a little bit because they their understanding of what we are trying we are trying our best. Like we're doing everything we can to put the best practices in place to help with these fixed congestions, with help with the travel uh yeah. arrangements that we have. Think our guys at the minute, the position we're in, they're excited, they're looking forward to the international event yeah. because they actually get some some extra time off. And um, when they're in, we do train hard. Um, any player that signed for us this year pretty much would say that the intensity here is much, much higher than the club they've come from. Yeah. And they'd be much higher level clubs as well, typically. Um, and yeah, so when that kind of, at the moment, it's nearly every four to five weeks an international break now. So it, it actually acts as a really nice deload, like a natural deload week for us. So we get a number of days off and then we'll try and get in a friendly. So the last break we we tried to arrange one that fell through, so we had an in-house instead. But 
I know the next one coming up, we're going to try and have a have, an in, uh, have a friendly arranged. So players that haven't been getting the minutes will be guaranteed match minutes um, where, and still having their time off as well. Whereas the lads that have had loads of minutes, it's a really, really good opportunity to, to tone them right back and have them prepared for the next almost four-week block, four or five-week block. Awesome. Really good. Jordan, have you got anything else on that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I think it, it highlights, isn't it, that obviously the eyes of the world are typically on the Premier League and the Championship, but League One, League Two is, and I, I know from my time at Lincoln as well, the, the really tough leagues. To, to and, and then you can add that right down to National League. I'll talk about this with the player I work with today. Like getting up out of the National League is a hell of an event and a hell of a task anyway. League Two, again, League One, like you say, when... I, I remember seeing it happen all the time with the, the lack of clarity over international breaks. It's a nightmare to try and plan. So I think credit to, to credit to you guys for, for again last season. And when you are going through that, you've got staff coming in, you know, equipment that you're trying to get, but you can't get yet because of budgets and things, and still achieving um and still achieving promotion in in an amazing way. I like all credit to you and the coaching staff and the MBT and the players essentially as well. So well, what I want to finish on, though, we've had Luke Taylor on uh, the pod from uh, Oxford. He was talking about, he was he was reflecting on, I think they did an open top bus tour um, and reflecting on just that feeling. And I wanted to ask you guys, because what we were talking about there was it's very rare as performance and medical staff that you get to, to share. You see it now sometimes with, you know, the big teams, the elite teams of Man City's and Liverpool's. The, the manager winning manager of the month and they put the entire, you know, it looks like the whole capacity of the stadium in terms of staff with them in, in, in front of the photo. But it's rare as a performance of medical staff, you get to properly celebrate that. So what did you do to celebrate? I've got to ask. And and just just take us through some of those feelings. And I know Bessie's laughing because I've spoken to him about this before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it sex rated? Yeah, it's it's right. it's it's right. it's right. it's what was the feeling? It's on the record, is it? On the record. <laughs> yeah. This is very it's much on the record, record, but there is explicit on it, so that's fine. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. right, so be part of this whole next time. <laughs> um, right, where do we start? Well, Steve yeah. didn't drink water for about three weeks. So <laughs> that's <he's>, normal. <laughs> um, so we got promoted and won the league on the Tuesday night. Yeah. So... A mental game as well. Yeah. Like, we must have, yeah. yeah, we left Fratton. Late. One, two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah late. And then the next day was the end of season two. Mm. So those two days blurred into one. <laughs> but uh, here, because um, I've had a few promotions, but this promotion here was, it was leading into the final game. The manager asked all the staff, what are you doing next week on these between Wednesday and Friday. If you're free, let me know. Yes, we're free. All right, send me your passports. All right, so send the passport. So basically, took us away. So we went out to uh, Portugal, stayed in the villa. There was eight of us that could do it. Just two days. Brilliant. <laughs> Great. <laughs> what happened in Portugal stays in Portugal. <laughs> but it, it was brilliant. Brilliant. So you, you had the manager, you had the assistant, you had yeah. an analyst, you had us four all there. Yeah. Um, it's just brilliant. Just a great two days. And then um, it was short, sweet, but come back. But it was just a great time. The players went to Vegas. But we, we, we had our bit. And uh, yeah, it was brilliant. And then... Um, Steve had a curfew. We didn't know. <laughs> 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 I had to get a bike. Yeah. He, he's not drinking yeah. no, I started quite yeah, early. anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it was good. We celebrated it. Um, yeah, Jesus. Can't remember half of it, but it was no. um, yeah, so we did we did celebrate. The the lads went out, I think that was in the press, they went out and celebrated in Portsmouth. Um, but rightly so, they deserved it. Yeah. Um, and it was it's times like this when you get them, I've had them before and they just go. You might never get them again. So when you get it, celebrate, enjoy it, take it in. It's some people are lucky enough to have years and years and years of success. What happened last season? Some of those players in the squad that might be the only time that ever happens to them. So it's enjoy it. 
it's it's a brilliant feeling. There's nothing better in football, in any sport, to get promoted, be the best team in your league, etc. There is nothing better to enjoy. And um, we did. Yeah, we did, yeah. yeah. I think as well that one of the nicest things is in pre-season, sporting director um, had all our League One medals. So he did a, we just had a, not a night out as such, but we went to the pub in Croatia and he just made a nice little moment about it, a nice little speech about everyone individually, he gave the League One medals. <laughs> it yeah. felt like Portugal 2.0. Yeah, it's <laughs> <in the big, laughs> it yeah. literally yeah. went, yeah. oh, it's escalated yeah. so quick. But I think that's just because we've got such a good group, players, staff, yeah. cohesion is great. Everyone's really comfortable with each other and it just, you celebrate the wins. And you celebrate well, and we probably celebrate really well. Actually, so, yeah. 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 I think that's so important from everything you mentioned before, Steve, as well, in terms of the sacrifices that family make and yeah. everything that goes into. Obviously, that you, we're seeing that as like the final day, lifting the trophy and all the rest of it. But obviously, that's come from months of hard work in in your roles, hasn't it? So I think it's it's really important that. No, no definitely, definitely, and. You have a night out and then you have a proper night out like yeah. this. And uh, I always laugh about this. Like when you go out, your, your missus is always a bit like, oh, but they love, you don't get promoted every day. And that's it. I can't say anything. Yeah. There's nothing to come back in. So, uh, but no, it's great. We enjoyed it. The, uh, and, uh, the Wednesday we went out was actually, it was actually my birthday. And it was actually a really awkward one for me because. My missus had planned something and uh, I had to go on, unfortunately. You can't get promoted. <laughs> so, unfortunately, no. I'm, uh, I'm off to Portugal. Uh, yeah, but I think, I think the big thing for me is like that, 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 that game, that Barnsley game, I don't, I, I can't quite describe the feeling of, especially with these guys around me, how the game went. It was two on down, came back one, three, two, and 90 whatever the minute was shots just head up mm -hmm. um and i think from probably the 88th minute up until 1am it's just a blur okay. because like you, I couldn't, you couldn't put into words how you felt like i think there was moments where obviously the, the fans come on the pitch and we had eighteen thousand fans on the pitch however many it was um you, you look around and you see the gap up in the stands like with a stack sorts in its hand and just like sporting directors mm -hmm. around you and, like all the lads around you i think like where we did have such, not just uh, from the start point of view, play point of view as well, properly tight-knit group, mm. just everything was escalated slightly further. Um, and obviously the celebrations that night, obviously we stayed in the manager's office and players did uh, whatever they did. Um, yeah. But I think like from that, those kind of few days afterwards were just phenomenal. We didn't see the lads until Friday, played Wigan on the Saturday, didn't go quite our way, they did we turned up for a game of Saturday. <laughs> Best game um, no, but it was it was I think those those three days around around that after that that night which is a, a different world really. And then obviously Portugal when we went out there was again immense. Yeah, level level. What we'll do is we'll leave the podcast running in a bit and tell them it's finished, Jordan, and then we'll get the rest of the story and release it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, lads, that was absolutely quality. That's kind of what we wanted the podcast to all be about today, sort of reflections. But, yeah, I think that side of it is super important. There's obviously some great work being done from the department, but also it's great to hear how the team has been brought together as well. I think that's been a, a really good takeaway from this episode. So I really appreciate you coming on, giving up the time and speaking so openly about it. Um, any final thoughts for you, Jordan? No, I just really, really appreciate it. Um, and I know you stayed late from a hard day as well. So, uh, yeah, appreciate you coming on. It's a really good format to just get, like Ben said, everyone's perspective from an MDT point of view. Because usually we might get, you know, one sports scientist or a physio or an S&C. And all of a sudden we've got everyone chipping in and you can definitely see how well you guys knit together. Um, so, yeah, kudos to you all. Really good episode. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, cheers, lads. Thanks. 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 Thanks for having us. Yeah, no, no, no. Jordan, that was kind of the first of its kind, but we just mentioned then that I think we need to get a few more departments on like that, don't we? Because it's really cool to hear all different perspectives in one go and then sort of interacting with each other and seeing that as well on camera. Yeah, it's really, it's really impressive. And I think, obviously, we I asked the question, we alluded to it in terms of size of department. Um, 
obviously Martin's episode we were talking about how sort of sports science evolving. We've had previous episodes as well. We're talking about siloed um departments within departments, if you like. Um, but I think today's episode is a really nice one where you could see a cohesive MDT team from all different backgrounds, all different clubs, um, all different experience levels and all this sort of stuff coming together and they just get on really well. And I think that then you could see that, and obviously the stories they were telling about Portugal trips and all this sort of stuff, you can see that it, it's with the players, it's with the sporting director, it's with the manager and stuff like that. And um, obviously I work with Bestie really closely. He's, he's our sports therapist and rehab at the performance hub. So I got to hear all of the stories from um, from from that outside anyway, which is, which is great. But um, I think it, that alone, I think, shows because, you know, they're trying to do well in, in the championship. I've just won League One. And Bestie is still coming and working with injured players and a private setting with, with us at the hub as well. Um, and I think that shows, you know, the, the staff care. They genuinely care and they, they really like their roles. They love what they do there, but they just genuinely care about helping players. And that that came through even on even on the on the screen. So yeah, if we can get more more departments on sharing their opinions and stuff like that, I think and how each different department works from different clubs and different walks of life, that'd be really, really good. I think it, one of the important things for me was like trying to pull out some factors that were that led into that cohesiveness in that team. And the things that stood out for me, obviously, they, they sort of had the joke about the big table and yeah. the meetings, but I think that's obviously had an input. Um, George mentioned that it's like an open room, everyone's got a voice, like you can you feel like you can speak up, really important. Mm-hmm. Um, probably that can't be downplayed. Like I think that's a, that's absolutely crucial, isn't it, to have that. Um, the court was was yeah. a funny one, wasn't it? But yeah. that, at the same time, how many, we see it all the time where players will have fines lists, and that is essentially to maintain standards with the players. So staff to do it in that way, but to do it in like a kind of like a tongue in cheek way, but that it does it'll definitely keep you on point that, wouldn't it? Because you get you're yeah. gonna think about if you do something once, you're probably not gonna end up doing it unless you're bestie. You're not gonna do it again. So, and, and it's a really important way of doing it as well. I like that because um, I, I've been at some previous clubs which have done it different ways. But if if you mess up, you know, and you, you're the first one that's done it. I remember I once ran a yo-yo level one rather than a yo-yo level two. And you know pretty much straight away it's gone wrong. Um, and you just got to watch it happen. And I, I let it run and then straight away after I said to the coaches, I've, I've messed up the wrong level, should have checked the recording, yada, 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 didn't clock it, really poor for me. I was really early on in my career and I never made that mistake again. Now, how the staff around me handled that was fantastic because they could see I was livid with myself. I was was really, really annoyed. I know what I messed up. Some bosses, some line managers, some coaches that you're working with, some of the other NBT team, they might come down on you hard and they might go, Jordan, you absolutely dropped the ball. That was rubbish. What are you doing? You clearly don't know your job. And it just makes you feel this small. It makes you feel even worse. But some departments will go, actually, let's do it in a like more jovial way. And that's a big fine. So in their example, then holding court, they go, you really you know, messed up there. That's a bigger fine than that. Mm-hmm. And I've seen other ones as well where, you know, sometimes it's who's on the coffee rounds, who's, who's bringing the coffees in for who and stuff like that. But it holds you accountable. But also it does it in a way that, let's face it, in performance sport, elite sport, any level, any sport, if you make a mistake, you know, and you're everyone's we're all our own harshest critics. You know when you've messed up because something will have happened. You, you don't need a, a a boss to come in and go rah, 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 and start shouting at you. And that's that's what Steve's talking about in terms of personal skills. You might have the best knowledge of sports science, medicine, anything in between, nutrition, whatever it might be. But if you haven't got the personal skills to go, they've messed up, but they know they've messed up. They're feeling down in the dumps. Let's. Let, let's get them on side again in a nice way, but also make them realise, don't make that mistake again, please. That, that's a real strong, uh, important point. So I think, I think yeah, it's, it's, it's a great way of getting the cohesion, keeping it ticking over. But like you said, holding hold, hold people accountable, really good. Yeah, the other thing was, which is obvious, the, the, the whole knowing families, going out together, I think that's crucial. I think it's Mike Boyle. A long, long time ago, I remember he, hearing him say that, would you go for a beer with someone? And that was like his one of his factors for hiring staff. Like if he didn't feel like he could, then he probably wouldn't hire him. And that's not talking about any sort of technical skills. That is literally talking about the person 
personality, um, sense of humour, which the lads have obviously got there as well, which is another great thing to see that, yes, they, they're, they're professional, they get on with the, the work, but the, there's obviously that side of it as well where they actually have fun. Steve mentioned it, he spent a hell of a lot of time at training grounds, stadiums, in the club, with other coaches. Like, enjoy it. Like, you, you're working in professional football. Like, so what a lot of people want to do. So if you're not enjoying it, you, you do really do have to look at yourself in the mirror and go like, what, what am I doing this for then? If I'm not, if I'm not enjoying myself day to day, there's got to be other things you could potentially do and other avenues you could take. Like the, the guys there are obviously enjoying it and they're enjoying working together, which is really good to see. Yeah. And, it, and again, like you say, it comes through. Um, and I knew when I started the physical performance hub, I already knew Bessie really well. I got on with him very, very well. I speak to him more than I speak to my missus sometimes, to be honest. And you know, it's like there's no there's no doubt in your mind. It's the same with Steve, knew Bessie really well, brings him on board, and then you know, Max was already there and all that sort of stuff. So again, like we, we always know and we have this debate, don't we, in the industry of um it's who you know, everyone everyone always says that and everyone believes that, I, I believe. Um, and there is an element of that, but because if you know somebody and you trust them in this role or in, in sports science in a professional football club, in you know, medicine and professional club, you know, whatever it is. You have to trust that person because, like you said, you're with them so much. You almost, I always say, like you're in the trenches together, sort of thing. Like when one of you's running around trying to chase the GPS vests, you know, have you turned them on? Have you turned it on? But the waters need to go out. Um, is the medical gear out? You know, this, that, the other, everything going on at once. If one of you's just like, oh, I can't really be asked, you let the whole, the whole system down. So if you if you like them, if you trust them, if you if you know they've got your back. They're, they're worth the weight in gold. So those practitioners are very, very important. And that comes from being in an environment you like, being in the environment you you feel valued and you're trusted. Um, and then, you know, that team just stays really, really strong. And I think, yeah, it came through again, I keep saying it, but, you know, if you can actually go outside of the work environment and spend time with them, that only will strengthen the work environment because there's those little inside jokes so there's little bits where you say like oh you should have seen what he was wearing at the weekend you, you see him trousers oh my god and that banter you know it kicks on for the week doesn't it and it it just yeah. strengthens the bonds and i think uh, my personal opinion an environment like that will always trump an environment where you've got maybe you know real high spec knowledge but you know might not have very good personal skills like steve said shuts the door goes home never speaks to them again don't know anything about family well where would you rather work yeah. i think that's an obvious one personally but that's not everyone's cup of tea. I get that, but no, I think um, some really, really valuable points. And we've spoke a lot about cohesion. We've spoke a lot about team ethics, about you know, um, direction of departments, direction of clubs. And I think that was a really good episode to just just highlight some of the soft skills and just how being together as a team and going out and enjoying your successes and knowing the families, being a human being together is really important. Funny that. <laughs> No, it's true. There's, there's loads more we can speak about with it, and we won't because um, we'll we'll bring yeah, it to yeah. close. But I thought that the really interesting stuff was Steve, Steve talking about the hiring process of bringing the guys in. I thought the other interesting thing was that the club were the team were flying. So when you make the changes, that's obviously it's like we mentioned. It's a nice problem to have, but it is it is one of those things where you sort of waiting for any sort of slip up where you can go right. I can I can implement this now because I know it'll be beneficial. So I thought that was really interesting to get that insight for them as well off the back of such a, a successful year. And we spoke about availability a lot as well. Steve yeah. and the lads obviously mentioned as well that they had a hell of a lot of injuries last year too. So to get the promotion on top of that, I didn't realise that either. Um, yeah. That's even more impressive, isn't it? And, and shows the strength of the squad and the, probably the, the staff as a whole as well. So no, I really enjoyed that one. And we'll definitely... Um, any. Any departments out there that are interested in coming on and doing that, hopefully it'll be beneficial for them as well. If you want to do it and you've got a few members of staff like in, in different roles like the guys have done, reach out because we're, we're definitely looking for a few more episodes like that. I think it'll be re really beneficial to people. So just to wrap up, big thank you to our sponsors. Make sure you go and check them out. Good prep. I'm going to go and have one of their meals right now because uh, I'm starving. Rezzel and also Hydro. Big thank you to, to the companies that support the podcast. And Jordan, thanks for your time, mate. I loved it as ever. Really, really good.